Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. In this chapter, titled The Great Victory, we journey through the pivotal moments of Alexander's conquest as he cements his place in history as one of the most formidable military commanders of all time. As the chapter unfolds, we find Alexander firmly in control of vast swaths of the Western Asian territories, encompassing Asia Minor, Phoenicia, Judea, and Egypt. After his strategic and cultural exploits in Egypt, Alexander's story takes us back to Tyre, where he skillfully organizes and administers his burgeoning empire. So sit back and let's delve into the world of Alexander the Great. Prepare to be transported back in time to witness the unfolding of The Great Victory, a chapter that is not just a story, but a piece of history that continues to fascinate and inspire. Chapter 9 The Great Victory, B.C. 331. Alexander had control over the entire western part of Asia. This included Asia Minor, Phoenicia, Judea, and Egypt. After his visit to Egypt, he went back to Tyre and appointed governors to rule the conquered provinces on his behalf. The damage to Tyre was fixed after the siege and assault. It became a wealthy, powerful, and prosperous city again. Alexander took a break there and celebrated with grand parties and festivities for several weeks. The rulers from nearby countries came together to enjoy his hospitality, participate in the games, watch the plays and spectacles, and join in the feasts. They also gathered to show respect and honor him. In short, he was the main focus of attention for everyone and received admiration from all. However, throughout this period, he was not satisfied and did not feel that his work was complete. Darius, who was considered his great enemy, was still in the field, not yet subdued. Darius had withdrawn beyond the Euphrates and was busy gathering a large army from all the eastern nations he ruled over, preparing to confront Alexander in the ultimate battle. Alexander then made plans in Tyre to establish proper governance for the different kingdoms and provinces he had already conquered. Afterward, he started getting ready to lead his main army eastward. During this time, the women from Darius's family who were captured at Issus were kept as prisoners and made to travel with Alexander's army. Alexander didn't agree to any of Darius's plans or offers to free his wife and mother and instead chose to keep them as prisoners. However, he treated them with respect and great consideration. He gave them luxurious royal tents and transported them with all the regal pomp they were used to in Darius's court whenever his army moved. Alexander's treatment of his captives in this way is often considered a demonstration of his noble and generous character. However, true kindness would have involved returning these sorrowful and innocent prisoners to their husbands and fathers, who grieved deeply over their separation and endured their painful hardships with immense sadness. It is likely that he treated his captive queens with respect and honor, motivated by policy and self-interest, rather than by showing compassion for their suffering. Having them as trophies of his victory was a great source of glory for him, and the more he honored them, the more glorious the trophy appeared. Accordingly, Alexander did everything he could to make his royal captives seem more important. He surrounded them with a large group of people and made their movements grand and impressive. Shortly after leaving Tyre and marching eastward, Statira, Darius's wife, became very sick and passed away. The news was quickly delivered to Alexander, who promptly went to Sisagambis's tent. Sisagambis was Darius's mother. She felt very sad, lying on the floor of her tent. The ladies of her court surrounded her, sharing in her sorrow. Alexander tried his best to soothe and console her. After Queen Statira's death, 
a member of her staff fled from the camp and informed Darius about it. Darius was overcome with grief. The officer, however, in later interviews, told him about the kind and respectful way that Alexander had treated the ladies throughout their captivity. This greatly relieved his worries and brought him a lot of comfort and solace. He expressed gratitude to Alexander for his generosity and kindness. He said that if his kingdom of Persia had to be conquered, he hoped that it would be conquered by someone like Alexander. If you visualize the landscape in your mind, you'll notice that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers run side by side, coursing through the heart of Western Asia and ultimately spilling into the Persian Gulf. The land between these two rivers, which was very crowded and fertile, was called Mesopotamia. Darius had gathered a huge army here. The different groups occupied all the flat areas of Mesopotamia. Alexander changed his direction slightly to the north, with the plan of crossing the river Euphrates at a well-known ancient crossing at Thapsacus. When he arrived at this location, he came across a small Persian army. However, they retreated as he approached. Alexander constructed two bridges over the river and successfully led his army across. Meanwhile, Darius, with his large army, crossed the Tigris and moved northward along the eastern side of the river. He had to cross several branches of the Tigris as he moved forward. At one of them, called the Lycus, there was a bridge. It took Darius's huge army five days to cross this bridge. While Darius was moving northward, he knew that Alexander had to cross the rivers in that area. Alexander and his small but brave Greek troops were moving eastward towards the same region where Darius was heading. Alexander finally reached the Tigris River. He had to cross the river by walking through it. The riverbanks were steep and the current was fast, putting the men at risk of being swept away. To avoid this danger, the soldiers held onto each other's arms as they moved forward so that they could support each other. They held their shields above their heads to keep them dry. Alexander waited like the others, but stayed in front and reached the bank first. He stood there and used gestures to indicate to the advancing column where to land, as the sound of the water was too loud for his voice to be heard. Seeing him standing there, safely landed, looking confident and triumphant, gave a burst of energy to all the soldiers crossing the stream. However, despite this encouragement, the troops crossing and landing on the bank caused a lot of confusion. Many of the soldiers had tied up a part of their clothes in bundles. They held these bundles and their weapons above their heads while walking through the fast-moving water of the stream. They, though, couldn't carry these bundles, but had to leave them behind eventually to save themselves. They struggled through deep and fast water, walking over a hidden surface of slippery stones. Many bundles, along with spears, darts, and other floating weapons, were carried downstream to hinder and obstruct the men passing underneath. Eventually, the men managed to cross safely, but they lost a significant amount of weapons and clothing. There were no enemies on the bank to confront them. Darius could not actually oppose Alexander's attempt to cross the river because he couldn't predict when and where Alexander would try to cross, making it difficult to gather a large army to stop him. Alexander's soldiers were smaller and faster, so they could easily avoid the large enemy forces trying to stop them from crossing the stream. In any case, Darius didn't try that, and Alexander didn't face any problems when crossing the Tigris River, except for the physical obstacles caused by the current of the stream. Darius's plan was not to stop Alexander on his journey, but to find a suitable battlefield where he could gather his forces and arrange them strategically to wait for an attack. He understood that his enemy would come looking for him, so he had the opportunity to select his position. He discovered a field in a vast plain at Guagamela, near the city of Arbela. This location is widely recognized as the plain of Arbela. Darius spent several days assembling his enormous armies on this plain. He constructed camps and leveled uneven ground to ensure smooth movement for his large cavalry units. Additionally, he made efforts to protect the entrances as much as possible. 
In warfare, there is a small tool called a caltrop. It is made of a small iron ball with sharp points sticking out in different directions, about one or two inches long. When these objects are thrown on the ground randomly, one of the points will always face upwards. As a result, the horses that step on them get injured and become unable to move. Darius spread these objects, called caltrops, in the grass and along the roads where Alexander's army would likely come during battle. Alexander, after crossing the river, camped for a day or two on the banks to rest, refresh, and reorganize his army. During this time, the soldiers were scared one night because the moon disappeared for a short time. Whenever there is a lunar eclipse, it happens when the moon is full. So, an eclipse is an abrupt and unforeseen decrease in the brightness of the moon. People who are unaware of the reasons behind this phenomenon can become quite frightened. Alexander's soldiers were greatly alarmed by the eclipse. They believed it was a sign of divine anger towards their audacious act of crossing rivers and invading another king's territory from a far distance. Actually, the men were inclined to be afraid. They had gone a long way from home, crossing mountains and deserts. They had now also crossed a deep and risky river and were near an enemy much larger in number. It was normal for them to feel some doubts. And at night... When they looked up at the round moon, feeling the solemnity that night always brings to unfamiliar and unique sights, they were happy to see her bright and cheerful expression, as if she was their companion. But then the moon started to fade, changing its shape and dimming its light, casting a disturbing and gloomy glow upon them. No wonder they felt scared. Actually, there is always a bit of fear in the feeling you get when you see an eclipse. It gives the spectacle a serious and impressive atmosphere. It makes even the most educated and sophisticated persons stay quiet as they look at it. The soldiers of Alexander were extremely frightened. Panic had spread throughout the camp. Instead of dismissing their fears or trying to calm them down with logic, Alexander took the situation very seriously. He gathered the fortune tellers and asked them to discuss and inform him about the meaning of this significant event. Just involving the fortune tellers in the matter had a major impact on all the soldiers in the army. It made them calm. It turned their restlessness and fear into a sense of anticipation as they waited for the response from the fortune tellers, which was much less painful and risky. And finally, when the answer arrived, it relieved all their worry and fear. The fortune tellers said that the sun was supporting Alexander, while the moon was supporting the Persians. They believed that the sudden decrease in the moon's brightness predicted the Persians' upcoming defeat and destruction. The army were happy with this decision and were filled with renewed confidence and enthusiasm. It is often pointless to try to fight ignorance and absurdity with weak tools like truth, and reason. The smartest leaders have usually been most successful when their strategy has been to counteract one foolishness with the influence of another. Alexander's army had around 50,000 men, with the phalanx in the middle. The army moved down the eastern bank of the Tigris River. The scouts went ahead in all directions to gather information about the enemy. In this way, two large armies moved towards each other, like insects crawling on the ground, feeling their way forward. Finally, after three days, the scouts reported about the enemy. Alexander quickly moved ahead with a group of his soldiers to confront them. They turned out to be not the main part of Darius's army, but just a group of 1,000 soldiers ahead of the rest. They withdrew as Alexander approached. However, he managed to capture a few cavalrymen who revealed that Darius had gathered his massive forces on the plain of Arbala and was prepared to fight his advancing enemy there. Alexander stopped his troops. He set up a camp and organized where to put their belongings. He gave the soldiers a break, checked and fixed their weapons, and prepared for the upcoming battle. These tasks took several days. At the end of that time, early in the morning, before daybreak, the camp started moving. The columns, armed and ready for battle, moved forward. 
they expected to reach Darius's camp at daybreak, but the distance turned out to be longer than they had anticipated. Eventually, the Macedonians reached the top of a hill and saw countless lines of soldiers and horses, along with many rows of tents spread across the plain. Here the army stopped, while Alexander looked at the field, studying the numbers and arrangement of the enemy for a long time and with great attention. They were still four miles away, but the Macedonians could hear the murmuring sounds of their voices and movements through the quiet autumn air. Alexander gathered the top officers and discussed whether to attack the Persians that night on the plain or wait until the next day. Parmenio suggested a surprise night attack to catch the enemy off guard. However, Alexander disagreed. He was confident in his ability to win and believed that his enemies were completely under his control. Instead of taking advantage of the situation, he chose to confront them directly and openly without hiding or avoiding them. Alexander had an army of 50,000 soldiers, while the number of Persians was estimated to be between 500,000 and a million. There is something amazing about the idea of the Macedonian phalanx and its wings pausing on the hill slope, holding back its attack against enemies ten times its number to give their opponents a fair and equal chance in the battle. Alexander gave encouraging speeches to his soldiers because they finally achieved what they had been working hard for a long time, the entire Persian Empire. Now, they were going to compete for overall control rather than just individual provinces and kingdoms as they had done before. The victory they were about to achieve would put them at the highest point of human glory. In all his statements, he confidently assumed that victory was certain. Alexander finished his preparations and then went to sleep. He went to sleep, or at least he seemed to. Early in the morning, Parmenio woke up, gathered the men, and prepared everything for the march. Afterward, he went to Alexander's tent, where he found Alexander still asleep. He woke him up and informed him that everything was prepared. Parmenio was surprised that he was sleeping so peacefully when there was so much at stake. Parmenio said, You seem so calm, as if you have already fought the battle and won. Alexander replied, I have. I believe the entire task is accomplished when we have gained entry to Darius and his army, and he is prepared to fight us. Alexander soon appeared at the head of his troops. This day was very important to him, and a historian from that time recorded a description of his attire for battle. He wore a short, fitted tunic with a tightly wrapped linen breastplate on top, which was heavily padded. The belt that held the tunic had decorative figures. It was a gift from people in the countries he had conquered and was highly admired. He wore a polished steel helmet with a neck piece adorned with precious stones. His helmet had a white feather on top. His sword, a gift from the king of Cyprus, was light, slim, and perfectly made. He also carried a shield and a lance, both designed for practical use rather than show. As a result, his attire was in line with his actions. It was plain and practical, with its value lying in its strong qualities that would make the wearer most effective in battle. The Persians used elephants and chariots with scythes to fight in their wars. They would drive the chariots among their enemies and mow them down. However, Alexander did not use any of these tactics. There was a powerful military formation called the phalanx that moved either as a whole or in smaller groups. It consisted of infantry in the center and cavalry on the sides. Alexander the Great trusted in the strength, courage, energy, and unwavering determination of his soldiers. He organized them in straightforward formations and led them directly into battle. The Macedonians displayed great strength as they fought their way through the enemy forces. The elephants fled from the battle. The soldiers seized the horses of certain chariots equipped with scythe-like blades and cut the ropes. In consideration of others, they moved to the sides to let them pass, but were quickly captured by the men behind them. Meanwhile, the phalanx kept advancing, utilizing the flat terrain to their advantage. The Persian soldiers were defeated and forced to retreat whenever they were attacked. 
In short, by nightfall, the entire large army was scattered and confused, except for a few hundred thousand who were either dead or dying on the ground. Darius ran away. Alexander pursued him with a group of horse soldiers until they reached Arbola. Arbola was where Darius had been staying and where he had left a lot of money and valuable things. When Alexander got to Arbela, Darius had already left and gotten away, but Alexander took control of the city and the valuable things. After winning a major battle, Alexander and his army were forced to leave the area a few days later. The dead bodies of 300,000 soldiers, elephants, and horses were left behind because they couldn't be buried. This caused a terrible smell and disease, rendering the region desolate and lifeless. Alexander quickly moved his troops away, leaving the land empty and contaminated. Alexander traveled to Babylon, where the governor of the city was ready to receive him as a conqueror. Many people came out to meet him, and all the roads were filled with spectators. The city walls were also crowded with people who came to watch the event. Alexander felt proud and happy to finally achieve his dreams of glory. The royal treasures of Persia were kept in Susa, a strong city located east of Babylon. The Persian kings would stay in Susa during the winter, while their summer residence was Ekbatana, which was further north among the mountains. There was a beautiful palace and a very strong fortress at Susa, and the treasures were kept in the fortress. It is said that during peaceful times, the Persian kings gathered coins, melted them, and poured the gold into clay jars. The jars were afterward broken off from the gold, leaving the bullion in the form of the interior of the jars. A huge amount of gold and silver, along with other treasures, had been collected in this way. Alexander knew about this storage place before he went to meet Darius. On the day of the Battle of Arbala, right after he won, he sent an officer from the battlefield to ask Susa to surrender. They followed the call, and Alexander, shortly after his grand arrival in Babylon, went to Susa and claimed the huge amount of wealth stored there. The quantity and value were immense, and taking it was a grand act of looting. In fact, the killing of the Persian army at Arbela by Alexander, and his subsequent looting of Susa, can be considered the largest case of murder and robbery ever committed by an individual. So, by doing these actions, the great hero finally achieved the notoriety of having committed the greatest and most impressive of all human crimes. There is no doubt that these actions were truly wrong, because Alexander had no other reason for invading other than his desire for power and wealth, which is essentially a desire for violence and stealing. They are only protected from being called crimes because there are no laws on earth and no courts powerful enough to condemn such massive thefts, like when one quarter of the world violently invades and robs the other. In addition to the treasures, Alexander also discovered a collection of trophies in Susa. These trophies had been brought by Xerxes from Greece. Xerxes had invaded Greece around a hundred years before Alexander's time and had brought the spoils and trophies of his victories to Susa. Alexander sent them all back to Greece. He then continued his journey to Persepolis, the capital of Persia. Along the way, he had to pass through a narrow passage in the mountains. The local people in the mountains were used to collecting tribute from anyone who passed through, as they believed they had the right to receive payment. They sent a message to Alexander when they heard that he was coming. They told him that he had to pay a toll if he wanted to pass with his army. Alexander replied that he would meet them at the pass and give them what they deserved. They knew it and got ready to protect the pass. Some Persian soldiers joined them. They made walls and barriers across the narrow paths. They gathered large stones on the edges of cliffs and slopes of the mountains to roll down on their enemies. By all these means and others, they tried to stop Alexander from passing through. However, he managed to send troops around using difficult and indirect routes that even the locals thought were impossible. This allowed him to surprise his enemies by attacking them from above. As always, his plan worked. 
The locals were forced to retreat, and Alexander continued his march towards the major Persian city. As we conclude Chapter 9, The Great Victory, in our enthralling Alexander the Great audiobook series, we appreciate your presence in Alexandria. This chapter has guided us through a tumultuous period marked by Alexander's unparalleled strategic prowess and his unyielding quest for dominance in Asia. Now, we eagerly anticipate Chapter 10, The Death of Darius. This next chapter promises to be a riveting narrative that delves into the culmination of Alexander's ruthless pursuit and the tragic fate of his once mighty adversary Darius. We'll explore the pivotal moments leading to Darius's downfall and how these events reveal the evolving complexity of Alexander's character, from a conqueror to a figure of power and excess. Join us in Chapter 10 as we uncover the layers of intrigue, betrayal, and the profound impact of Alexander's actions on the course of history. This chapter is not just a continuation of a remarkable story. It offers insights into the intricate dynamics of power and the human condition. Prepare to be immersed in the next installment of our series. Click on the upcoming video link or find it in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to Alexandria for the latest updates. Like this video to support our journey through history, share it with fellow history enthusiasts, and stay tuned for the unfolding legacy of Alexander the Great.